free to move around. All right, so I'm Erin. Um, and I run a fast channel that on YouTube that hosts lots of these types of videos. And so if you need more materials or if you're about to teach statistics or you want new materials for your stats class, our stats tools website has this laid out as um, by the level of the course. So we have an intro to uh, stats, or so baby stats, and we have an intermediate level course and a graduate course and structural equation modeling. So we have lots and lots of tools if you are interested. Um, or this lecture and lots of mediation and moderation, including freeway interactions, mediated moderation, and some combinations of those. So I just some background information that I kind of expect you've already got is that you already know what regression is. Um, so you understand predictors and prediction, correlation, and then just to, like you know what power is and data screening. I'm not going to make you suffer through data screening like I would my students, but the handout that you have does have data screening step by step in the style that our lab does it in. Um, with the caveat, it's just a suggestion. And if you want to learn more about data screening, we have a bunch of videos on how we do data screening. So what do I expect you to learn? Well, clearly mediation moderation. Okay. And so we'll start with mediation, and we'll do the traditional Barron and Kenny sort of view, because it's a good place to start. Where did mediation start? How do people think about it? And then the Sobel test, which people use to determine the index of mediation, and then the newer methods, so the more Hayes conditional style um, of indirect effects and bootstrapping, and then we'll do an example. Now for moderation, we're gonna talk mostly about special considerations for moderation. This is multicollinearity, centering, do simple slopes and an example, but I left that off the slide. So we'll do an example of each one. Uh, I will probably do this in SPSS. Uh, I'm an R person, but I understand that I'm an R person. <laughs> so we'll, we'll walk through this in SPSS, but the R guide is the exact same layout, so you could follow along. And if you have R questions, feel free to ask. Um, I will talk R with you for hours. You'll probably be like, oh God, get this lady away from me. Mm -hmm. right. So. <clears throat> So we're gonna jump right in. So uh, I also wanted to leave some time at the end if you have very specific, like I have this problem kinds of questions. Um, so what is mediation? Well, it's a situation where you have some relationship between X and Y, so a predictive variable and some outcome, and you expect there to be a third party involved, so some third variable. So that's the mediator. I always tell students to think about this as the third wheel problem, because when you're 20, that makes sense. Right, and so it's some sort of uh, love affair in this third variable. And we expect that third variable to change the relationship in some form between X and Y. So notice I did not say eliminate the relationship, that's the older view, but change that relationship. And so I stole these from uh, Andy Field's book. If you like um, stats books that are not too expensive, he has one in every flavor of programs that are just great. It's the way that mediation sort of works is you have some sort of predictor down here that we expect to predict the outcome and we'll come back to that question of does X have to predict Y? That's one of the more recent kind of questions. But then we also expect there to be some sort of mediator. That mediator is going to change the relationship between the predictor and the outcome or X and Y. There's some called, mostly called the C path. So the A path is the predictor predicting the mediator. I do not know why these are not alphabetical order, but they aren't. The C path is the predictor predicting the outcome. <clears throat> B is when X and M are in there together. Okay. So it's not a simple mediator to Y, it's the mediator and X to Y. And then C prime is what happens to C. Okay. And we'll go through those some more <clears throat> uh, when we do an example. So mainly, the new version of mediation is all about that indirect effect. So if I take uh, A times B, I'm getting a, a measure of how much it changes going from predictor to mediator to Y. Um, so you could also do this as a structural equation model of like one to two to three. <clears throat> so very traditional view, old stuff. So Baron and Kinney. This has been cited, I think I made this slide a couple years ago, but like just thousands and thousands of times. So it's still really popular um, for people to use. And it's, it's the backbone structure of the newer sort of, I hate to call it the Hayes process because it's not totally his, but he is the, the strong voice in this 
um, in the newer types of models. So what we'll do is we'll predict that outcome uh, from the predictor. So this is x to y. And you'll see that on the, the, the example slides, I have like always have it labeled like x to predicting y. And does that have to be significant? I get this question a lot on my YouTube channel. Um, kind of depends on your theory. If you think about this in a purely mathematical view, no. It doesn't, we're really trying to see how much C is changing. So C could be non-significant, but change a lot. Um, if your theory posits that uh, X should predict Y, then probably. So I kind of skate the middle here. I think if you're trying to show that um, X predicts Y and then this other variable eliminates that relationship, you should probably show that X predicts Y. But if you are trying to show that M changes Y, some, or M changes X to Y somehow, then maybe it's not so important that it's significant. Uh, and so that's a, a side I think a lot of people are like, does it have to be significant? It's like, well, not really. Um, but there's some, like, that's one of the back and forth thing, pe things people argue about. Okay. But let's say we want X to predict Y. Okay, that's step one. Step two or stage two is going to be using X to predict the mediator. Okay, so X to M, this is path A. And so we want to show that X leads to M, because then we're trying to show that M leads to Y. So we're trying to create this three-step process. And then last, we're going to use X and M together to predict Y. And we're going to kind of see what happens to X. So if you um, have done regression for a while, this is actually really a test of suppression. So we're trying to see how much adding M suppresses the relationship between X and Y. <coughs> And so the old four mediation conditions, C, path C is the first one. Uh, predictor must significantly predict that outcome variable. This one, people don't really, eh, not so much anymore. Next one is A. This is not an order, alphabetical order. Would make more sense in alphabetical order. Meh. So path A, <coughs> predictor must significantly predict the mediator. So that's X to M. Path B, where the mediator predicts the outcome variable uh, with the uh, X variable in it, so X plus M to Y. And the last one is something must change in X to Y. And so I've labeled this as it must predict less strongly. And what I mean is that the change is closer to zero. So sometimes what you'll see in mediation is you get these significant effects and C has gotten bigger. And I would argue that that is really not mediation. The purpose of mediation is to show that C is somehow getting smaller, closer to zero. Usually when C gets bigger, you actually are probably seeing the effects of moderation. With the caveat that hypotheses are more important in these sorts of things. So don't just switch to moderation to find something significant. Okay. <clears throat> now, some, some limitations to this approach. Um, what it used to be, and people used to term like fully mediated and partially mediated, meaning that C went from being significant to not, or C went from being significant, but it's still significant, crap, I can't publish that, let's use this term partial, and show that it just at least went down. Okay. I'm going to recommend just drop those terms all together. Okay. Does C change? Okay. So how much is it changing? Because that's really what we're interested in. So. Um, if you went to one of our talks earlier, or if you've watched my channel at all, uh, we're really big on effect size. So the indirect effect is a measure of how much it's changing. I think that's more interesting than is it significant or not. Okay. And so we really don't want to encourage the p-value problem that we already have and p-hacking. So we're just going to kind of say, is C changing? Right. And how much is it changing? So paired with the old approach, and people still use the Sobel test a lot, but they're using the Aorian Sobel. Sorry if I butchered that. So <clears throat> what we can do is take that indirect effect and estimate if it's different from zero. Okay. This still has all the problems of p-values, but we can tell if C is changing enough from C prime. So if the Sobel test is significant, we can say that there was significant mediation or there was mediation. And there's three different types of Sobel, um, but the one we're going to use that's 
uh, used to be in process, but I don't think it is anymore, is the ARM version, which corrects for the standard errors of A and B. Okay, so it's a little less um, overzealous in saying that you have a significant effect. So the way that the Sobel test works, in general, is it takes that indirect effect, A times B. So this is the coefficient of A times B, okay, which is the same thing as C minus C prime. And then divides by that standard error. So that's like a Z, it's a Z test. Okay. So I've got my indirect effect over standard error, which is almost all forms of Z. And the standard error is like this long, complicated formula, but it's essentially uh, this idea of like the products of A and B. So how much standard error is there in A and how much is there in B? And it kind of multiplies those together. And if that indirect effect is larger than the error, we would say that there's a, a change, right? So it's been uh, mediated. Now the newer stuff that I think is really cool is bootstrapping. So what is bootstrapping? You've never heard of it. It's kind of like the lottery if they put the balls back. So it's where you run this analysis many, many times and you take an average of it. So you're kind of creating a distribution of effects and that allows you to calculate a confidence interval. So it's, it's, it's taking the idea of sampling distributions and the central limit theorem, which you know, if you teach undergrad stats, you try and you struggle to explain <laughs> what's the difference between the real sample population and the sampling distribution. But it allows us to create one. And I can make confidence interval of that effect. And that's where uh, this really shines. So I can create my uh, indirect effect and how big is that effect, right? So really big confidence intervals I mean that the indirect effect is kind of vague, probably a small sample. The small confidence interval is more precision. So the way that bootstrapping practically works, now if you're using SPSS, this is really handy that the plugin will do this for you. If using R, you have to use uh, the boot, boot library, uh, and it will take a while to run on an older computer. Uh, but it takes these data sets and it randomly shuffles them and picks out people with replacement. So person number two can be sampled four times because we assume that person number two is representative of a group of people in the world. So it's kind of like the lottery if they put the balls back and you could get the same, you know, you get six three times. So we run this bootstrapping effect and we'll look at our confidence interval and we're going to tell if that confidence interval crosses zero. So if our confidence interval crosses zero, that implies that the indirect effect is zero. If it doesn't cross zero, it implies that it's not. So it still has that unfortunate black and white thinking, but it really allows you to think about the size of the effect more than the significance of the effect. So we're gonna use process. We're gonna actually use the brand new version three of process, um, but I also have uh, the help guides for the uh, version two, version 16 and 11 and all the ones in between. Um, I have found that version three is the same as two for these two simple things. My only un upsetting moment is that he doesn't have the templates for version 3 online. So you just kind of have to guess which model is which, which I found wildly unfortunate. Okay. Um, but we are going to use the new one so you can kind of see what that looks like. The nice thing with the new one is if you have categorical X or M, it will allow you to use categorical variables, which is really nice. Okay. <laughs> if you're an R person, uh, you can do bootstrap mediation in R. And that's going to allow us to create our confidence interval. And what we were ended with a second ago is if it doesn't cross zero, that implies that there's some sort of change in C. Now, I kind of talk about this as stages. Uh, in my class, I teach this like right after hierarchical regression. So this isn't a hierarchical regression at all. So it's kind of step one, step two, step three. But I don't want that to be confusing with hierarchical step one, step two, step three. So it kind of uses the term stages in my notes. Um, but it is not hierarchical regression. So some caveats for mediation. What does that do to data screening? And this is, I'm assuming you're doing simple mediation. If you've got covariates and stuff, you have to control for those, that sort of thing. <clears throat> but what you want to do is really start by screening both the IV and the mediator at the same time. Okay. Even though stage one is X to Y, we still want to know if M is normally distributed. And so we're going to screen both of those at the same time. So really, you're actually going to kind of screen the last analysis and then back up. Um, and so you're kind of screening the last model because that's the one you're most interested in, and you're screening all the variables. 
And so normally we screen kind of whatever we're doing first, but in this case you want to start at the end and work back. I will not bore you with all the steps today to screening, but I have included them. That's why it's so bad. The packet's so large. Now, how might I report that? So, uh, depending on how complex your model is, if you're doing very simple mediation, you could just make one of these cool triangle diagrams, the most popular. Um, you can present tables of coefficients. So, we did a moderation mediation model with like all these covariates, which just was a bad idea, but uh, we stuck all of it in a table. Or you can make one of these cool figures. Now, the nice thing about this is, especially in a simple way, so this is kind of an example of the table that we did, um, is that you don't really need the overall model unless you just want to report it. Because we're really interested in the path, so we're getting into the model. So you could talk about the overall f value with r squared, but really you're interested in those b's, so um, using the coefficients instead. Should you use beta? Probably not. Most of the analyses here are on uh, the unstandardized coefficient, so b, little b. Um, and once we start talking about multiplying them together and talking about indirect effect, that's unstandardized. So most people use the unstandardized solution. So this is what one of our tables looks like in one of our publications. Um, I don't recommend moderated mediation unless you're just like really gung-ho. Let's do an example. I made up some silly stats examples. This is going to stats talk early on a Saturday. <laughs> so hopefully they'll keep you awake. So does practicing these specialized regression analyses mediate the relationship between your confidence in your skills and your rating of your skills? So we got people together in my fake example here, and we had them rate their confidence in their overall statistics skills. And then I gave them a rating of their overall regression skills. How good are your stats? How good are your regression? And then we looked at how much they practice. Okay. We're going to see if, that me if practice mediates that relationship. All right, so before I get to SPSS, any questions on the steps? Yes? Uh, you get the data from yes, it's on the OSF page. Okay. Yeah, I wish they had the internet in here. That would be so much better. But yes, all the data sets, the slides, the handouts that you have, all on OSF. All right. So I'll try this. Um, this is going to be like a super tiny because of the display rate, but hopefully you'll be able to follow along if you've got the handout. I'm going to skip the first X number of pages here. So what the handouts really cover is kind of gives you all of our contact information. I do answer people's questions when it's not the first or the beginning of a semester. Okay. Um, it also has the plugin where you can download, which my computer is going to try to open Firefox. There we go. Um, and this version covers version three. And then if you want more information or the documentation on the actual plugin for SPSS, you do have to buy the book. The book is not terribly priced. So we're going to use model one for basic moderation and model four for basic mediation. It talks a little bit about assumptions um, and explains uh, how to run those assumptions in SPSS. And most of that's from Tabachnik and Fidel's multivariate doorstop. But I do want to cover power. So before we get started. So unfortunately, I can't make G-Power any bigger. Um, but G-Power is a free program. I uh, just Google G-Star Power. That'll get you there faster. And it is fantastic. So if you're wanting to more of a point and click kind of software for power, if you're using R, the power library is also really good. Um, this will allow you to kind of think about uh, calculating the sample size needed. Okay. Now, there are more complicated ways to do this, but this has gotten me by just fine. So let's go with the simple wrap. Right. So what you might select in G-Power, and I'll just use this since I can make this larger. <coughs> Bless you. Is the options for F-Tests. So this is a regression family, it's an F-Test. Okay. It's also linear multiple regression and R deviation from zero. So we're actually gonna 
test how big we think X and M together are. So it's not necessarily super easy to test how big the indirect effect is. That requires a lot of simulations. But you do assume that M predicts Y. Like that's the point, is that M and X together predict Y, but M in there is causing some sort of change. So you can kind of hijack regular regression power and just say, okay, I expect M to predict Y how much? Okay. So we're gonna use R squared for deviation from zero. Practically, I have to figure out what that means in Cohen's F squared. So there's a little button over here for determine, and that'll allow you to enter what you think R squared is and translate. So I picked a medium effect size for this example. Uh, I use alpha, it's 0.05, you can use 0 0.01, 0 0.10, your choice. Uh, beta, 80% power. So that's not actually beta, that's my typo here, it's power, one minus beta. And then the number of predictors. So if you're doing basic mediation, that's two, X and M. If you got other covariates, be sure to include those. And if you're gonna do double or serial mediation, then you'd have three. So it kinda depends on what you think your model looks like. I just did two. So with the medium effect size, I expect I need about 100 people. And so I, I love G power, it's my fave. <clears throat> so that's a really great way to, to uh, calculate how many people you might need. Questions? All right, blah, blah, blah. It tells you how to install process. I'm gonna kind of skip all the data screening so we'll have plenty of time for questions. But if you wanna know more about data screening, feel free to ask me afterwards. Yada, 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 yada. So it really, the magic really happens on page 14. If you're looking at the R guide, I have no idea. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. These are all made up data sets, so they are not linear or homogeneic at all. If you look at some of the plots, if you're used to looking at those, it's really quite awful. So I just had to know here, like, I'm not good at making up data. <laughs> all right, so let's say you got through all of this and you're ready to run it. I investigated everything, I know that my data is entered properly, I know that it's, but I have at least have a reason why maybe it's not linear. If you want to do some sort of non-linear design, this is where you really have to give up your love for SPSS, unfortunately. Um, so there are ways to handle non-linearity, but most of them are not, it doesn't really have a good option for that. So, I'll come over here. So analyze, once you install this plugin, there's, that is so small. It uh, pops up as a custom dialog. So the nice thing about this is it's point and click, it's a GUI version. And um, I actually have both versions installed, but it's under the regression box. So you can analyze regression and then process. Um, and that really allows you to pull up this window, which I will do over here so you can see a little better. I got excited. Yeah. So what's happening in this window? Well, we've got X, M, X, Y, and M. Okay, I can't read Y, X, and M. So our DV is gonna go at the top. That's our um, skills rating in this example. Uh, our X variable goes into X, so it's our confidence in this example. And if you're doing mediation, you stick it in mediator's box. If you're using the older version of process, mediation and moderation that goes in the same box. The new version of process, mediation and moderation are separate. And it does warn you if you do it wrong. So, which I did three times. So um, if you're doing moderation, you have to stick it in a different place. So this one's gonna be example four, which is the simple triangle mediation. It does allow you to change the number of bootstrap samples. 5,000 is really normal. Um, Honestly, between 1,000 and 5,000, I haven't seen many much results. It's like four decimal places back. So if your computers are kind of older, you can make it run less. Okay. Then we want to click on options. So the multi-categorical window is where this new version of process shines, and it allows you to handle categories with more than 
uh, two options. So normally you'd have to dummy code those if you had three options or four, uh, but this will dummy code it for you. So that's why I'd recommend the new one. If you have categorical data, the new one's gonna be really good for you. If you don't care so much about categorical data, version 2.16 is a little easier. <laughs> In that options window, um, I was told to show me the total effect model, that's X to Y. But that tells you something about this newer thinking on mediation is that you have to tell it to show you the first step. Okay, so a lot of people are just like, I don't even care about the first step, I just want to know about the indirect effect. Uh, but you will find reviewer number two who will ask you for the first step, so you might as well have it. Uh, ask for the effect size, it'll give you a couple different options. Uh, if you're looking at some of the older options and some of my older videos that hopefully are gonna be updated now, uh, a lot of those effect sizes have disappeared because they've realized that they have like kappa squared. Um, they had a math error in them. So this effect size one is the sort of newest thinking on effect sizes. I would pick some sort of heteroscedastic consistent type, but I at the moment have not read enough about the types that he has here, so I didn't want to recommend one to you without having read about it. But there are some options for heteroscedasticity that you can pick, there's four. And then the rest of the bottom is moderation. So I'm gonna hit continue and get into the output. So when you look at the output, and I'll show you this actually in SPSS, but it's way too small to read. So uh, The first thing it does is it tells you what you did. So this is handy because after about three lines of syntax, I'm like, wait, where was I at? <laughs> so it reminds you which one you stuck in X, Y, and M. And if you're working with students, you can make sure they put the right one in the right box. So we're really interested if practice mediates that confidence, um, confidence to skill relationship. Now the order of the, of the output is in alphabetical order. The first thing you're gonna get is confidence predicting practice. So it's not in the order of um, the traditional steps. Uh, they don't really think that you should do them in this order, but it does show you the, them in alphabetical order. So that helps me remember. Okay, so this one, first one is A. So does confidence predict practice? And because I cannot make up good data, it does, but it's negative. Okay. So as students are more confident, they practice less. I can kind of see that. Like, oh, I know what I'm doing, I don't need to practice. All I've got here is just a little explanation on how to write that up. So you get asked a lot about how to report this in APA style. Um, and the, the part that is a little hard is where does this 231 come from? So where does the degrees of freedom for T come from? That is the second degree of freedom for F. Okay. So remember, give one predictor, one X, one Y. Um, T and F are actually just transforms of each other. Okay. So uh, T squared is F. So we can use this degree of freedom, the degrees of freedom residual or error, whichever one you call it, as our df for t. So I'd report unstandardized b. So this is uh, for every one unit increase in confidence, they're practicing one unit or 0.11 units less. And I'd say that's kind of a small effect. You can also add pr squared to this sort of thing if you want like an actual measure of the effect size. All right, and feel free to interrupt me as we go um, if you have a question. So after A, what do we got? B. So then we're going to get B and C prime. So this is the model with X and M together. This would normally be the last stage of mediation. So we can kind of look at this. Let's do practice to regression. So that would be the B path. Um, so I am going to see if we practice more, do you feel like your skills are better? And uh, the answer is no in this case. So as students practice more, they feel like their skills are worse. And that might be because um, I, the more I practice, the more I realize I don't know. It could also, in the case of my class, because we were doing R. So they feel like the more they practice, the less it works. Um, it's also made up data. So the more I practice, the less confident I feel. 
and um, maybe it's imposter syndrome as well. Yeah. Could you explain in the model summary what you, what you just said, just uh, maybe first three or four statistics? This right here? In this example. Sure, sure. So the model summary gives you the regular ANOVA box. So you're looking at SPSS's regression, it gives you that ANOVA outcome. Um, and so this would be both predictors in the model at the same time are significant. So I would kind of do F2 and 230 is 19. Um, R is the correlation of the predicted scores with Y, but most people report R squared as the effect size. So about 14% of the variance in regression skill is due to both of these. Yeah. And if, if you're going to report one of the F statistics, this is the one people report because it's the only one that is two predictors. I would say, like, when I look at outputs of these, it's like half and half if they report F. All right. Okay, so students are not very confident, even after they practice. Now I can look at C prime, which is confidence predicting skill given that we're controlling for, adjusting for practice. So this, is, this isn't confidence to skill, this is confidence to skill given practice. And um, it is, so as my confidence increases, I rate myself as higher skilled. And that one kind of makes sense. So the more confident I feel, the more I rate my skills as good. But at the moment, I couldn't tell you if that relationship has changed or not. I can tell you that that relationship is significant, which, okay. But has it changed by adding M? And so that's really where the mediation part comes in. And so I told it to show me the total effect model. If you don't click that button, you will not see this particular part. And then this one's C. So how much does confidence predict skill without M? And so it's a bigger number. So I went from 0.36 to 0.29. So C is dropping, it's getting closer to zero, which implies mediation, and we'll get to is mediation there. But they're both still significant. And so this is where the old Baron and Kenny stuff doesn't really work anymore. Because this is where you would say something was partially mediated. Because the significance, it went down. But knowing what we know about p-values, that's not super helpful. So we're going to use the indirect effect as a measure of how much is it changing. So this is usually more of what we're interested in. How much can I change students' feelings about their skills by making them practice? So C, so C prime does get closer to zero, but I need some sort of evidence to back up my claim for mediation. Um, and so is that change different from zero? So if I keep scrolling through the output, you'll get the, the important part. So if you're one of those people like, just tell me if it's significant, this is the one you want to look at. All right. So it repeats, this, this output's always there, so it repeats C and C prime for you. Um, I like to ask for the total model in case you want R squared, right, and you want to report F. <clears throat> but the very first thing it tells me is if what C was, so you can see again, but the problem with it is if you're trying to report the degrees of freedom for T, if you didn't know what they were, um, this window wouldn't help you very much but in the total effect, like, grouping part, you could see that it's 231. Come back down. Yeah? Uh, okay, in this window? Under coefficient. So here. Sorry. Um, the, the order of the columns is the same as the SPSS normal regression windows except you don't get beta anywhere in this because the suggestion is that beta is not really appropriate to standardize on when the indirect effect is not standardized. So yeah, so coefficient, don't let me make an assumption that you know something too as well. So thank you. All right. <coughs> All right, so we did uh, C, C prime, and then here is the like money shot, if you will. The indirect effect window. Okay. And so that is C minus C prime. It's also A times B, mathematically. Okay. 
So if I took the A path times the B path, I would get 0.07, but it's also C minus C prime. And that's true for simple mediation, not so true for the other types of mediations. If you're doing serial or some of the other more complicated ones, that's not true anymore. Okay. Um, but 0.07, so it, I have changed their, um, the relationship between confidence and skills by 0.07. However, on the output, it says practice next to it. Okay. That's because it's the indirect effect of practice has changed confidence to skills, 0.07. So I think that's the, one of the more confusing parts about the output. So it's the indirect effect of practice, but what's practically changing is confidence to skills. It ran all that bootstrapping for us. So this, uh, these three pieces here are the bootstrapped um, standard error. So after 5,000 runs, what's the standard error for 0.07? It's about 0.04, which is kind of big. Okay. So normally these are very small numbers. Okay. The lower limit is almost zero, but it's not quite zero. And the upper limit's about 0.15. So this would be a good place to look if you're trying to figure out how much might, might I think about this for another sample. So if I run a pilot study or I've got, I want to run part two, like how much mediation should I expect? But what we would interpret this as is, um, does this include zero? No. So this is a good indication that this mediation is different from zero. And then based on theory and not made up examples, you might say that this is small, medium, or large. So kind of compared to previous results, what size would you expect this to be? Um, you can also look at these kind of uh, other types of effect sizes. So they're calling the indirect effect an effect size. But a partially standardized indirect effect is kind of trying to mimic R squared a little. And then a completely standardized effect. So these are different versions of kind of where you want to make beta happen. I ask for them, but I always just report the indirect effect because it's easier to explain. Most people understand the indirect effect because it's C minus C prime. There's no fancy symbol for the indirect effect. I would report it just like this in a sentence. Uh, and include the confidence interval because that's really where you're making your claim. Is this mediated or not? If you want a Sobel test, or if reviewer number two wants a Sobel test, um, I use Chris Preacher's website to do this uh, if I'm not using R. And so he's got a whole bunch of explanation on the Sobel test is only useful in large samples, and you really should use this type of Sobel and not that type of Sobel. So if you want more justification on the different types, it's actually pretty readable. Um, <clears throat> But he'll show you all three. I, the one thing I don't like about this is that it shows you all three, which kind of encourages in picking the best one for you. Um, but from what I've seen, the, the uh, middle one is the best. So what I put in here is the A path. This is the unstandardized coefficient from A, so 0.11. The B, which is 0.67. Uh, standard error for A and the standard error for B. So let me back up and show you where you get those. So I'm going to go back a couple pages here to page 17. Okay. So B here is practice to skill. Okay. And standard here error is under SE. So your inner A and B and their standard errors. It does all the scary math for you. The formula is also on his page if you want to see what it's doing. And I could say that the Sobel test was significant, just barely. So it really mirrors this confidence interval thing. So if we're going to use 0.05 as our alpha, we would say that this was significant. But if you remember, the confidence interval is very close to zero on the bottom, and this is very close to 0.05. So I feel like they give you pretty similar results. Um, I was trying to include both because then one, somebody will be happy right, when I'm reporting these things. And I also like to think about giving people the most evidence. So here's the Sobel test. If you're the Sobel person, here's the confidence interval. If you're in the newer conditional stuff, they both say the same thing. Here's the evidence for you. But we'd put that as a Z. Yeah? Um, so because the bootstrapping is doing multiple replications of the sample, would you say that the confidence interval 
like let's say I have a confidence interval that's really, really close to zero, but that being close to zero is more stable than a p-value being very, very close to 0.05. It, the p-value is like a stick test. It's like sudden. That's a good way to think about it. Uh, I have more confidence in confidence intervals. <laughs> um, <laughs> minus the arguments over how they should be interpreted. Uh, sure because, especially bootstrapped ones, but yeah. they still are only representing that sample. So they're trying to give you a better view of like what population might look like, remembering that's still only this sample being replicated a bunch of times. Um, I think I like it a little better because it also, it bootstraps with replacement. So you're sort of assuming that, you know, person two is probably represented by multiple person twos in the world. Um, but if that's not a good assumption for your data set, then confidence intervals may not be good. <clears throat> okay, so in, overall, what we would argue is that there's probably mediation going on because the confidence intervals support that. The effect, uh, the um, so Bell test supports that. If you are uh, like in love with p-values, they also sort of support that, um, and. I'd probably argue this is small, right? because the, the change, the indirect effect is small, the confidence interval is kind of close to zero, so this would be a small effect. Okay. I, there are no rules for small, medium, and large. Unfortunately, Cohen did not get to that. Um, and so I would really base that on my knowledge of the things that I'm doing. And because I get asked this a thousand times, I've got an example right up for you. Um, and so I just have like, uh, an example of how I might report some of this uh, in a simple way, explaining each path one at a time. Um, I did, I'm citing Hayes' new book that just came out since I'm using process three. And then I'm increasing Baron and Kenny's count. Right. And then I just walk through, is it just the same way we walk through it, reporting each one? And then people really like pictures. So I always like to include like, examples of what this might look, up, look like when you're trying to write it up. So, questions on mediation? <coughs> yeah? I have a question on the, um, this one that clicked on the Bell test. Yeah. So, it's going to be quick, uh, where the A and B, uh, the S goes to A and B, where the value is coming from, because I'm trying to look for that in the output. Right, in SPSS, or you want to see R? Uh, SPSS. Yeah, okay. So, if I look at page 17, that's where B is at. So, B is practice to skill. Yeah, so uh, the one next to the coefficient. It's just like essentially that coefficient row. Other questions? Yeah. So we can typically present both the Sobel test and the confidence interval? Yeah. And then hope if I got the reviewers who are like, rah, 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 Sobel, I'd just take it out. Um, Mainly because I feel like any time that I've just reported it more, the more newer style, you get that reviewer that's like, but what about the Sobel test? So, I always start with giving them too much so they can tell me to take it out. They don't like it. And I think that would also depend too on like the journal. So if you see that they're never doing it, maybe I might leave it out. Yeah. All right, well, perfect timing, so we can do moderation. I'd love to give everybody like a three second brain break though, <laughs> because if you wanna get some water and move around for a couple of minutes, um, and that will also allow me to switch all my handouts to moderation. 